I have the pleasure of introducing the next governor of the great state of New Jersey, gubernatorial candidate, Seth Grossman. The second thing I want to bring up is, you know, why am I running for governor against Chris Christie, so, the so-called most popular governor we've ever had in the history of New Jersey? 74% approval rating. I looked him up on Facebook. Has 44,000 Facebook friends. I have 706. <laughs> uh, has uh, $2.5 million in his campaign war chest. Uh, I start out with about uh, $4,700. I'm probably down to about $1,500 now. Uh, so how can so few of us even dare to go against Chris Christie? And let's look at the other side of the coin. What happens if we don't? What happens if we do nothing? Where do we stand? It means that Chris Christie takes us to hell at 20 miles an hour as opposed to the Democrats taking us there at 80 miles an hour. What's the difference? And it's also worse because if Chris Christie takes us to hell, then he's taking us there in a bipartisan way that nobody's responsible. We just had to go to hell. But uh, at least by, uh, uh, if the Democrats take us to hell, at least they own the policy and we show an alternative. And there's another practical way out of it. And people say, well, why don't you run for, uh, why don't you run against Whalen for, uh, for, uh, for state senate? Well, if I ran against Whalen for state senate, do you think that Christie would fight me any less? Would I be any less of a threat to him? And I couldn't just run against Whalen. I'd have to run against Ballas to run against Whalen. And everything would be lost in the confusion of local politics. But I learned that if you want to attack a snake, you attack the head. You don't chase after the tail. And Christie is the head. And to all the people in the Tea Party movements, the conservative movements, who are going to uh, council meetings, township committee meetings, zoning board meetings, planning board hearings, talk about Agenda 21 and how they don't want it in their community. Uh, they are attacking the tail. Because the only reason your local towns are, are doing all that is because Chris Christie, the governor, has appointed top people in the Department of Environmental Protection giving $300,000 bribes to any town that goes along with this agenda. So isn't it more effective to attack the head of the snake than the tail? And the same thing with the core curriculum. They're brainwashing our kids in school every day. We now have three generations of kids going to high school, going to grade school, who think that this country was conceived not in liberty but in evil. We were evil, violent, racist people who had nothing but war and violence and injustice, who polluted the planet and destroyed the environment. And thank God the progressives came along with Bill Clinton and Barack Obama who were fixing all that injustice that was there. They don't know about the 300,000 mostly white guys who died in the Civil War to end slavery, the creation of the Republican Party. They don't know about John Brown. Uh, they think he was a nut. You know, they don't, you know, he's like a Tea Party guy. They didn't think he was a guy who set the stage for doing things. So, but if you want to fight that, you go to your local, local school board, you're treated like a nut. You don't know anything. We have experts. But if we take that issue to the head, to the governor, that governor, you appointed the head of the Department of Education. All these people are doing the stuff that you want them to do. Let's make them an issue, an issue there. And, and the same thing I, I read about uh, in Ventnor. The insanity of having to lift your house 15 feet off the ground after a bad storm. I mean, let's face it, we at the shore, we know, we don't live by the ocean because we have to. We like living by the ocean. We like the beach. We like going out in our boats. We like getting a little sunshine and breeze. We do it because uh, we, we, we like uh, being by the ocean. But we know there's a danger that every 20 or 30 years there'll be a bad storm. And we might get a couple inches, a couple feet of water in our ground floor basement. But as they say that with that movie, this is the life we have chosen. The, the benefits outweigh the risk. And if every 25 or 30 years we have to uh, clean out the basement, replace the heater, that's worth the joy of living by the shore. Uh, we didn't put our houses 15 feet off the ground after the hurricane of 38, 1938, or 1944, or 1962. Uh, and uh, what would have happened to Atlantic City if we were forced to do that? Would have killed us. So why are we doing it now? But yet the homeowners who are talking about common sense ways of saving their own homes, where they're going? 
They're going to the uh, FEMA, F-E-M-A, hearings in Ventnor, or town council meetings in Ventnor. I got news, if they, if they all started showing up with the Grossman for Governor signs, they got a lot more attention doing that than by doing, uh, going to these local hearings, because again, if you want to kill the snake, you attack the head, not the tail. And there are also some other advantages. Uh, had I run and say a different people say, well, it's not the right time. Christie's too popular. Yeah, isn't that great? Because uh, Christie is so popular, there's nobody else in the race except me and Christie. And there are no other elections in the country except me and Christie for governor here and someone against someone for governor in Virginia. So there's nothing going on. So there's an opportunity to bring our issues to public attention in a way that has never been there before. And we have the resources to do that because all we have to do is get on the radar screen. Uh, and it's not that difficult. Now, I, I admit, I cannot do this by myself. But if you are out there, you know, you, and, and by the way, 75 of you circulated my petition to put me on the ballot. Had I tried to do it myself, I wouldn't have made it. In fact, at the petition of elections, uh, rather the uh, division of elections, the deputy clerk complimented me and said that was one of the best put together uh, petitions they'd ever seen. And I, I have to admit now, I was on the verge of giving up about two or three weeks ago. I think I only had about 300, two or three weeks ago. <coughs> what happened was that about 74, 75 of you just went out there and, and got the petitions and you got them notarized. Uh, and I, I just want to you know, give specific, uh, Barbara Brown yeah. got a bundle of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> And, and, and by the way, it, it was Peter Boyce who invited me to his church, the Fairton Christian Center, uh, who uh, actually I was sitting in there in the church and the, 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 the pastor, I guess Pastor Moore, made a point. He's saying, no one's had several miracles happen in this church. Uh, and I, I think I became one of those miracles because a, after I was there to give that my non-political speech about Passover, which some may think was slightly political, uh, the, the, the Reverend invited me to ask for signatures. I picked up about 50 or 60 that day. Uh, also, Connie Sabatoni, uh, her friend was sick in the hospital. So uh, she was visiting with him and when he was like out under sedation, she took the peti petition around to all the hospital floors. So again, I don't know what condition the people were who signed, <laughs> when they signed that petition, but they were all good registered Republicans. I can tell you that, and it, it, was, it was valid. So I want to thank you for doing that. And, and, and then there were many who it was just like that movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I just went to the mail and there'd be 10, 15 petitions in the mail, all perfectly notarized. That's what put me over the top. So, so now that you've got me there, we, we have a group of 75 here. Uh, and, and we have uh, roughly about 700 people who have affiliated with Facebook. I have about uh, six or 700 people open up my emails every uh, every week or every couple days when I send them out. But then think about this. Uh, you know, what, what's the, isn't there a movie called 300 Spartans? Yeah. Uh, somehow, I don't remember, is there any movie or book called 800,000 Persians? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> because nobody thinks about the 800,000 Persians. They think it was the 300 Spartans who changed history. So we are the 300 Spartans and what we have to do is each of us uh, have to reach out and reach the 300,000 people who are going to vote in this primary election. And it's seven weeks away. Now, seven weeks away seems like not much time, but in politics, seven weeks is a very long time. It's almost the summer. Uh, people have been making suggestions. Why don't you go on Mark Levin? Why don't you go on the Breitbart show? Why don't you do these things? Uh, and, and yes, I'm sending out tweets and messages, but if you start doing that stuff, uh, they might start saying, who's that Grossman? It's almost going to be like, uh, like with Ayn Rand, you know, who's John Galt? If signs start showing up saying, repudiate the debt, uh, Grossman for June, uh, sooner or later some reporter is going to notice that and say, who the hell is Grossman, what the hell is repudiate, and what's going on in June? And that will lead to things, and I will be pointing that out. So what I really need is, is not just you know, 300 or 400 people say, I'm going to vote for you. I need three or 400 people who are going to say, 
let me be Seth Grossman's campaign manager in my little world, in my little universe. How can I reach out to five people, 10 people, 100 people? And as we do that, we can make a big difference. Now, let me talk about some of the key issues. And, and the other thing that we have, besides having just one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and, and, and besides having many candidates, many issues, and I must admit that I'm disappointed that you know, Steve Lonigan and Murray Sabrin and, uh, and some of the Tea Party folks have not gotten on board. But this is a chance for us to show what we can do. Because remember, we've been doing this for 10 years. We've been bottled up in Atlantic County. Nobody ever heard of us. But this is the time that all that training, all that learning, all those mistakes we learned from, that now we can take that message that we're ready to take it to the rest of the state. So, uh, so, so this is our time. Now, now what are the, those, those issues? Uh, number one issue, repudiate the unconstitutional debt. We've talked about this many times. And many conservatives and many Tea Party groups, they know the United States Constitution backwards and forwards. They know the Declaration of Independence. But they forget that there was a crisis in, the, in, in, the, in this country in the 1830s that almost destroyed the country. Actually, there were probably uh, uh, three ma main problems in America at the time uh, that were so severe that many people in the 1830s were about to say, this, this experiment of American democracy was a nice idea, but it just didn't work, and it's coming to an end in 1830. And actually, Abraham Lincoln made speeches about that. And actually, if you go to the graveyards of Atlantic County, you see evidence of that mood in the country of despair. Because when you look at the graveyards of the people born in the 1790s, 1800s, you see names for the men like Richard and Robert and William, you know, Summers, Smith, Skull, all those things. But suddenly, in 1820, after 1820, 1830, you start seeing names like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Who are they? They were old Obadiah, the old uh, Testament prophets who were warning that the country of Israel had gone off the path and was in danger of being destroyed if we did not get back to our basic principles. So one of those evils, of course, was slavery. And you'll notice in the 1820s, 1830s, John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, many people suddenly said that it, now slavery was supposed to die out, but it's getting stronger because there's too much money in it. Uh, you could buy a slave for $15 in Africa, sell a slave for $400 in Annapolis. That was almost like the drug trade of its time. And so uh, it turned out we paid a price, a bitter civil war where 300,000 Americans died to end slavery. But there were two other evils going on. One was the evil of what we call systemic corruption of government at the state level. And I won't bore you with the whole theory, but there's a, a, a phenomenal professor of economics, of political economics at the University of, of Maryland called John Wallace who told the whole story. But basically the states at that time were making special deals for anyone in business. In other words, back in the 1830s or 18, uh, 1820s, if you wanted to start a business, form a corporation, you couldn't just file papers and form a corporation. You had to get a special act of the legislature to do that. You want to build a, any kind of a building, you need a special act of the legislature. So to do that, you had to have a friend to give you a special deal. So it was pay to play corruption right there in the 1820s and 1830s. And there was something else going on. Uh, this uh, idea of the government borrowing money to uh, buy votes and to buy favors. Because everybody knows if you're a politician and you spend money on somebody, you make a friend. But if you raise their taxes, you make an enemy. So how can you spend money without raising taxes? You borrow the money. And so New Jersey, like most states, borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. And the final straw that broke the camel's back was they started building canals all over New Jersey. And they were gonna pay back the bonds with the money they collected from the boats and the canals. Except for one thing, somebody discovered the locomotive in the railroad. And it made those canals obsolete before they were finished. And so there was no tolls to pay back the bonds. And all the banks had nothing but these worthless bonds in their vaults. So the banks failed and the state failed. There's a total catastrophe and many people said, 
That's the end of America. We tried it, didn't work. Except the people of New Jersey did something extraordinary. They made a new constitution which led the way out of that depression, that collapse called the Panic of 1837. It was our New Jersey Constitution of 1844. And there are two basic elements of that constitution. And it could still read fragments of it today. Number one, everybody gets treated equally by the state government. Uh, they get taxed equally. The laws that apply to one apply to everybody. And number two, the state could not borrow money without approval of the voters. And that constitution got us out of that economic collapse. New Jersey was the most prosperous state in the country for 100 years until, once again, we forgot what made us so prosperous uh, and we forgot our Constitution. And so we started shipping away at the Constitution. Our Constitution said everybody had to be taxed equally. But after World War II, they said, well, our veterans fought hard in the war. Everyone has to be taxed equally except for veterans. They get a break. And then the farmers complained. They said, we're the backbone of the state. So then it said, everybody is taxed equally, but veterans and farmers get a break. And who could be far behind but senior citizens, 1960s. We want a break too. So the Constitution was changed. Everybody gets treated equally except for veterans and farmers and senior citizens. And now more people are voting for more stuff because someone else is paying for it. And then the taxes got so high that the real estate developers said, we can't afford to build anything because the taxes are too high. So then we had a new change in the Constitution that said uh, everybody pays the same taxes except for veterans and farmers and senior citizens and real estate developers. And what, do you, what I mean by that, it means that if an area is blighted, then the town could call it a redevelopment zone and then they don't have to pay the taxes everybody else pays. And we see what that, what that became. That became the Revel Casino. Doesn't have to pay taxes for 20 years. So we, we've seen how we've, we've, we've messed up our Constitution by making special deals for, for special people when the whole idea of liberty is equal justice under the law. The second thing is borrowing without public vote. Uh, at first, we, we used to have these votes on public debt. They all got voted down. And the Democrats and Republicans say, oh, that's awful. We, the people are just too stupid to understand how important this stuff is. So we'll figure out a loophole against uh, this thing that says we can't borrow money without public approval, completely forgetting that it was this pay-to-play politics and the debt that ruined New Jersey in 1837. So what did they do? They said, oh, instead of having the state borrow the money, we're going to set up the Economic Development Authority. We're going to set up the Atlantic County Transportation Authority. We're going to set up the Atlantic County Improvement Authority. We're going to have the New Jersey Higher Education Facilities Authority. And they're going to borrow the money. And guess what happened? They, they borrowed the money, and then they went broke, uh, these agencies. So now, and, and by the way, they promised pensions. Uh, we want to give teachers, firemen, cops. We're going to, we can't give you raises because if we gave you raises, we have to raise taxes. So we're going to keep your pay only a little bit higher than everybody else, but we're going to give you these beautiful pensions when you're 55 and you can retire and there's no connection between how much you pay and how much you get. So, uh, but who's going to pay for it? Oh, it's in the future. The people who haven't been born yet, they'll pay for it. Well, they didn't get a chance to vote on it. So we, we, we created this whole disaster and the way out of it is we've got to dry up that borrowed money and, and, and treat everybody equally, just like we did in 1844. So that's why the key to my platform is uh, repudiate all unconstitutional debt, have the law treat everybody equally. And the first step to treating everybody equally is to dry up the borrowed money, because the borrowed money is corrupting the whole system. Rush Limbaugh says, who could argue with Santa Claus? If we're gonna give $100,000 to your town for this project, who's gonna say, uh, don't do it if the only answer is, well, we'll put the $100,000 somewhere else. If we dry up the money and we say, if we want a $100,000 project, do we want to raise our taxes to pay for it? That's the first step now, to cleaning things up. as a lawyer, I deal with people who, who are in this problem all the time. Families who are making $30,000, $35,000 a year, but have eighty dollars or $90,000 in credit card. And I tell them right away that they could live on omelets and peanut butter 
for the next 10 years and they will never repay that debt because the interest is just too much. And we're in that same situation. So how do we stop? It's quite simple. Uh, of the somehow 240 to 250 million dollars of debt that we have uh, for the uh, 3 million families of New Jersey, I, I don't have time to do the arithmetic, but I'm guessing it's about 80, 90 thousand dollars a family. Uh, how are we going to get out of that debt? Well, only about two or three percent of that debt is, uh, is approved by voters. The rest was not approved by voters. So the short answer is, as governor, without going to the legislature, without going to the courts, I will say I have the duty as the chief law enforcement officer of the state not to violate the Constitution. And I will not pay one penny towards this illegal and constitutional debt. Now that will cause a lot of turmoil. Uh, and what will end up happening is they'll end up doing what Donald Trump does yeah. all the time. And that is we'll end up paying 10 or 20 cents of the dollar, get ourselves out of debt in five years, and go on with our country. And one of the things that's remarkable is that with the Revel Casino, built with $1.2 billion of debt, where they said, and I wonder what the monthly mortgage is on $1.2 billion. I guess it's a lot of money. More money than the casino could possibly make. So when the casino went into bankruptcy and said, we are restructuring our debt, paying everybody 10 or 20 cents of a dollar, everybody said, that's a wonderful move. Because now the Rebel Casino can thrive. How come those same politicians, when I say, let's restructure the New Jersey debt, how come they're horrified by doing for you, the taxpayer, what they will do for their friends and big business? And to give you an example, of how evil this debt is. Right now there's a talk of having a new mileage tax uh, to pay for our roads and bridges. Now why do we need the, the mileage tax? We need the mileage tax because you ride around, our roads and bridges are wrecked. The potholes, bumps, you feel like you're going on some bumper car ride every time you have these roads. So why is there any money? Well, every time you go to the pump, you pay about a 14%, 14 cent gasoline tax on every gallon. So you're paying a few dollars into this transportation trust fund, but not a nickel of it is going to the roads and bridges. Why? Because they did this crazy financial borrowing about 10 years ago, and every nickel you pay is going to these bondholders. And not a, every dollar is going to the bondholders, not a nickel is going to fix the road. If we repudiate the debt, I would immediately say, that money goes to fix the roads and bridges. And if the bondholders squawk, uh, and if they take us to court, we'll make a nice reasonable deal of 10 or 20 cents a dollar. And then again, we'll have money to rebuild our roads and bridges without spending a nickel uh, you know, on new taxes. And that brings up another question. Maybe we should also end that practice of only hiring union contractors. Every time they say it takes $1.2 million to fix a traffic light, we'll have to say, well, how much can a non-union company do that for? And have uh, but I think it's something more. I think we can be more like the 300 Spartans, or the uh, uh, or or the the, uh, the 37 guys at Lexington that stood up in a line when 1,100 British troops marched up. So uh, we're actually we may be we're made up like the boys in Bataan. Remember them? We're the ba battling bastards of Bataan. No ma, no pa, no Uncle Sam, no uh, aunts, no uncles, no nephews, no nieces. No planes, no pills, or artillery pieces, and nobody gives a damn. Made no sense to defend the Bataan. They never had a chance. They held out for three months. At Singapore, when the Japanese attacked Singapore, they said, oh, we don't have a chance. They surrendered in three days. So who remembers Singapore? Who remembers Bataan? The fact is, by the folks who stuck it out at Bataan, they told the entire world that we Americans were different from the British, different from everybody else, and that's why probably if uh, Dennis Mahan and his wife were here, they'll tell you that, that, that the Filipinos are the most loyal friends of the United States today, because they remember. So, uh, so let's do what we have to do. Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> let's see if this video makes it around the state.